Hello everyone, I present to you a four-step thinking process for how to organize your thoughts during a chess game. This is going to be a framework for how to think whenever it's your turn in any chess position you might come across, especially if you're in a position where you're not really sure what to play in the first place. Now, what I'm going to do in this video is explain in this flowchart style how I think through positions myself at a bit of a subconscious level, but also these, this is kind of the thinking process that I recommend to students for how they think through positions as well. So. Let's go ahead and start right at the beginning. Your opponent's just played a move, whatever that move in the position might have been, and now it's your turn to play your own move or think through what you're going to do. What kind of thoughts go through your head? Well, depending on the, how the game might have gone, many beginner and intermediate players might unknowingly start really at any point in this flowchart. They might not organize their thoughts in a very cohesive manner. They jump from one kind of question in their mind to a different question. Some people think about a move instantly in the position and then don't really think about other questions that we'll talk about in this flow chart. Some people automatically see their opponent's idea, but they don't necessarily think about their own kind of forcing moves instead. Again, many people will start at one point in this flow chart, skip some steps, and not really go through the entire process, which is what we're going to talk about in this video. So here, though, we are going to be going through this chart together. After going through this chart, then we're going to be looking at some different game examples from games that were played between players in the 1400 to 1500 rating range on chess.com. We're going to talk about the situations where they played well with these steps in mind, and also positions where they made big blunders because they skipped some of these steps or didn't think through the positions correctly. Finally, after all of that, we're going to talk about how we can practice and train this thinking process. So let's go ahead and get right into it. Let's go from the beginning, step number one, all the way through step number four, and get started with it. So as you can kind of see here at the top left of the flow chart, the first question that I have here is, why did my opponent play their move? This is going to be the very first step. Our opponents just made a move. Why did they play their move? This is a very important question that we want to think about during a game because essentially chess at its, you know, at its core, let's put it this way, chess is a player versus player game. Your opponent has ideas for what they're trying to do in any position that they're playing. You have your own ideas for your side of the board as well. But if you are ignoring what your opponent is doing in the position, then you're kind of playing, let's say, like a PvE player versus environment type game compared to a PvP or player versus player type of game. So your opponent has agency or influence on the game. It's very important that you're always thinking about why they played their move, what they're trying to do, and you really don't want to ignore this step. Many, many players skip this first step, quite honestly. Their opponent makes a move. They kind of just glance over it. They, okay, they move their queen, whatever. They focus on their own move that they want to play. They play their own move, and they make a big blunder, potentially, because they didn't recognize that their opponent made a threat in the first place. So step number one, why did my opponent play their move? Now, you can kind of see below this kind of purple colored box. There's a couple of additional questions that go along with this as well. So uh, below it, it says, did they make a threat? Okay, did our opponent make a threat? Did they do something that we need to react to? This is the second question, uh, the second blue question there. Did they do something I should react to? Now, it's very important again to ask this question because if they did make a threat or they did do something that we need to react to, then we don't want to let them execute the threat. We don't want to let them execute their idea. If they attacked your queen and you just ignored their idea or maybe you didn't recognize what they were doing in the first place, then you lose your queen. That's probably a pretty bad outcome in most situations. So again, very important you think through your opponent's move to begin with. And again, we'll see game examples later where this kind of idea uh, or this question was implemented and then other positions where it wasn't implemented and then a big blunder was made and then a player lost the game very quickly. So you can kind of see further down the uh, chart here, if their move doesn't directly affect you, then you can move to step number two. And then there's this arrow that goes diagonally upwards. Now, skipping right below that, though, if their move does require a defensive response, if it is a move that you absolutely have to defend against, and we'll kind of talk a little bit more about times where you can actually ignore your opponent's idea and maybe make your own stronger move instead when we get around to step number two. Uh, but if their move does actually require a defensive response and you don't have a strong counterattacking type of move, then you're going to want to kind of jump all the way down to step number four. We'll talk about that a little bit later. You can see the little curved arrow at the bottom. Um, you'll want to move on to step number four, which revolves around thinking about your own move that you're considering playing, doing a little bit of calculation, and ultimately doing a blunder check. But again, we'll get to step number four in a little bit. 
So let's assume though that maybe their move doesn't directly affect us or they make a move that we don't necessarily have to react to in a defensive manner. Um, you could kind of say that even if you do need to somewhat be cautious of the move that they're playing, it's still good to go ahead to step number two here, uh, which is what forcing move options do I have? So a forcing move in chess is any kind of move that forces a reaction from the opponent, or at least, let's say, encourages a reaction from the opponent. Uh, the categories of forcing moves are checks, captures, and threats. If I make a check against my opponent, they have to react to it. You can't stay in check. You kind of have to respond to the check. That's just part of the legal rules, uh, rules for the game. If I capture something, especially the more valuable of, of a piece I capture, it's more likely that the opponent will want to react to that move and maybe equalize the material or capture something of their own. And if I make a threat, especially the more dangerous the threat is, the more likely it is for the opponent that they're going to need to react to my threat that I'm making in the first place. So that's what forcing moves in chess are. And forcing moves are very, very important because they essentially drive a lot of the, you could say, kind of dynamic play or tactical play that can occur in a game. So uh, this is where you start analyzing your different options for your own forcing moves. Do I have a check that I can make? Do I have any good captures I can make? Do I have any major threats that I can make? Uh, so if we go kind of down to the uh, second blue box here, it says, even if the opponent made a threat, so kind of going back to step number one, our opponent maybe made a move of their own. Maybe they actually did make a threat in the position. Maybe they moved a piece and attacked uh, your bishop or something like that. Um, the second blue box here in the second column says, even if the opponent made a threat, you might still be able to make an EST, which stands for an equal or stronger threat. And this is a way of playing uh, dynamically that strong players are very good at. The opponent might attack a bishop, let's say, and then maybe instead of reacting in a defensive way to what the opponent is doing and moving the bishop to safety or playing some kind of defensive option, uh, a strong player will look for ways to kind of counterattack or one-up their opponent. Maybe if the opponent attacks a bishop, you can attack a rook in, uh, in return. Uh, and then, you know, if they take the bishop, you get the rook. That's a good trade for you. If your opponent uh, maybe attacks your queen, which is a pretty high value threat, maybe you can answer with a check or you can threaten checkmate, or you can do something that's even more powerful or even more dangerous than the threat that the opponent is trying to go for. Maybe they capture a pawn, you respond by throwing in a check, or you capture a rook, or you do something, again, that's kind of higher up on the hierarchy of threats or higher up on the hierarchy of uh, forcing moves compared to what your opponent was doing. So, again, even if your opponent did make a threat in, this, in step number one, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to react in a defensive manner. It might be possible for you to react in a offensive or counterattacking manner. Uh, and this is why nowhere in here does it automatically say, uh, oh, just because the opponent made a dangerous move, you absolutely have to react to it. Um, it does say down there, if it, the move does require a defensive response, then you have to continue to step number four. But that's only if there is no strong offensive response in return is what it comes down to. Generally speaking, uh, the best defense in chess is a good offense. So if you can counterattack your opponent, even if they made a threat, it's usually a pretty good idea to be uh, looking for. Now, let's, let's say that you have no strong forcing moves, and maybe your opponent didn't make a threat. They didn't attack you. They didn't do anything you need to react to. You have no super strong forcing moves of your own. This is where now you move on to step number three. Uh, if you do have strong forcing moves of your own, you can skip step number three and move right along to step number four, do the blunder check that we'll talk about a bit later, and then you know proceed from there. But again, let's imagine that our opponent's recent move didn't do anything we need to react to. We don't have any great forcing moves of our own. We have no tactics to execute or anything like that. We move on to step number three, which is the third column. What improvements can I make in the position? So this is essentially where you could factor in any kind of positional improvement, any kind of positional play. Um, I have three different examples of questions you could ask yourself here. There are many more questions than this or many more ways to think about the position from a strategic standpoint. But the three questions I have here are ones that uh, famous trainer, Grandmaster Jakob Augert has uh, recommended. Can I stop my opponent's plan? Can I improve a badly placed piece? And can I attack or exploit a weakness? in the position. So first one there, can I stop my opponent's plan? Maybe the plan that they have in a position 
doesn't necessarily involve any forcing moves or anything that you need to respond to in a defensive manner, but maybe they have a plan to, let's say they want to improve a, they want to improve a piece. And maybe you have a way of preventing that piece from moving forward and getting to a better square. Then it might very well be a good plan for you to stop them from doing what they want to do, which makes their position harder to play and thus makes your position easier to play in comparison. So one question there is, can I stop my opponent's plan? The second question is, can I improve a badly placed piece? Maybe on your own side of the board, you have a piece that's not really doing very much. Maybe it's not developed. It's still on the starting square. Maybe it is maybe it is developed, but it's just not on a square that's very active. Can I get that piece to a better location and make it happier and more productive? So that could be a way to improve your position. The third question uh, in the blue uh, box in the third column there is, uh, can I attack or exploit a weakness? Maybe your opponent has a weak pawn, a weak square, a weak king. Can you take advantage of that and attack it as the game uh, is going along here? You know, maybe they have an isolated pawn. Can I attack that pawn? Maybe they have a weak outpost square. Can I try to get a piece to that square? Maybe their king is kind of exposed and a bit weak. Can I try to attack the king or go after the king in the position? So however you want to try to improve your position, there are many other things you can think about in this uh, category as well. I couldn't list everything out. Um, but pretty much here, you're just looking for a general improvement in the position, whatever that might end up being. So ultimately, throughout these first three steps, you come up with at least one move that you're thinking about in the position. I would say ideally you want to try to come up with at least two different moves in a position that you're trying to decide between. Um, and then this takes you along to the fourth step. Now, the fourth step here is essentially it's a blunder check. I could have labeled it here on the, uh, on the column. But the question you would ask yourself here is, you know, I came up with a move that I'm considering playing or maybe two different moves I'm trying to decide between. If I play move A or move B or move C, whatever move I'm thinking about, how might my opponent respond to this move? And this is a very, very important question that many players neglect to think about. I, I would probably say of these four steps, the ones that most players have the biggest trouble with, I would say, are really steps number one and steps number uh, step number one and step number four. Many players overlook or don't recognize or observe what the opponent's trying to do with their own side of the board in the position. And many players, for that same exact reason, if, if they they play a move that they're thinking about playing and they don't anticipate or consider what the other guy is going to play in response. So this is where you go a little further down this list on the fourth column, especially what forcing moves would they have or what forcing moves does my opponent have in the position if I play, again, move A or B or C or whatever you're considering playing. Uh, if your opponent does have some strong forcing moves or they have a good answer to your move that would be problematic for you, maybe you were thinking about moving a piece to a certain square and then you realize, wait a second, if I move it to that square, it'll get captured and that'd be bad for me. Then, you know, you don't want to play that move. <laughs> if you realize there's kind of a negative uh, consequence or repercussion for a move you're considering playing, you don't want to play the move. You want to think, uh, think ahead a bit and not just walk into trouble without anticipating what they might play. Now, uh, this is where I said earlier, it's important to try to have at least maybe two different moves you're trying to decide between because many people, they have only one move that they get to this point in the thinking process with. They have one move that they were planning on playing in the position. And maybe they do actually do their due diligence of thinking through this blunder check part and they realize the move is not very good. Well, now if you realize the one move you were thinking about is not very good, it feels like you have to go all the way back to step number one and try to figure out another alternative. And this is kind of where the final uh, blue box in the bottom right-hand corner, it says, if you realize your move is bad, then you have to go back to an earlier step and repeat the process. Um, again, if you had a couple of different move options you were deciding between, though, and you realize one is bad and maybe one of them is okay, then you have an okay move to play. You realize there's not a problem with it, and you play it. It's better to have a couple of options kind of carried along the way than, than make it to the final step here with a couple of options to consider between rather than only having one move that you're focusing solely on and then potentially realizing that it doesn't work. Uh, sometimes you might get to the fourth step and you only had one move you were considering and you do and you realize it does work. In that case, that's great. You're a bit fortunate that, that, that it works out that way. Uh, but I would say, generally speaking, trying to get to the fourth step with at least two different moves you're deciding between is, uh, is a good idea. Now, 
this is why in the second uh, kind of box there in the fourth column, uh, it says evaluate and compare your move options, then decide which one is best. So ultimately you have your couple of moves you're deciding between. You realize maybe move A works, move B doesn't work, or maybe mo maybe both moves A and B are working and not being punished, but you kind of just like one of them more than the other. Well, then ultimately you make a judgment call, you pick one of the two moves, and then you can see the red letters there, you, you play your move. Now, I know what a lot of people might be thinking when they see this flowchart. They might be thinking, okay, if I think through all of these questions, every single position I'm in, I'm just going to lose on time. And in some regards, if you do think too long on any individual move, you are going to run yourself into time trouble in, any, uh, in a game, especially if you're playing kind of a shorter time control game. Um, but I will talk later about how we can uh, practice this type of thinking process, how to practice it outside of games specifically, and so that you can get better and better with it. It'll ultimately become more and more subconscious, and you'll get faster and faster with it as you practice it more. So we'll talk a little bit more about how to train that later. Um, but for now, though, we've seen the four-step thinking process. We have kind of have all these different questions we can think about. Let's try to take this and apply it in a couple of different game positions uh, that I have uh, that I pulled up here. So let's move along into the uh, chessboard positions and we'll talk about these different examples. Also, I wanted to mention that there will be a download link for this flowchart in the video description below, uh, below the video if you would like to use this flowchart for your own training. All right, so we're going to start off with a position that focuses around step number one, which was again focusing on what your opponent is doing with their most recent move. So in this position here, white is making the move on to a4. You can see that the move was uh, just played here. And again, very important that we start off our thinking process. Why did our opponent play the move on to a4? Did they have any ideas with this move? Um, another question you could ask is what changed about the position based on this recent move? Uh, what new possibilities could come after this move? There's a lot of different kind of ways you could formulate this question, but mainly again, it's all focusing on why did the opponent make their most recent move? Do they have anything that they're trying to do that we need to be careful about? So if you think here, uh, what the opponent's trying to do with this move pawn to a4, hopefully you'll come to realize that white would really like to move the pawn up another square and push the pawn to a5. If white got to play the move a5 for free without us doing anything about it, then white would be trapping our bishop on the b6 square. We would lose material because the one-point pawn is attacking and trapping the three-point bishop, and that would be very bad news for us. So, for example, if you were in this position, you didn't think through this, uh, you know, you didn't consider what your opponent was doing with their move, it could be very easy to do something just like castling the king. We castle, and then all of a sudden you're, you get hit with the move pawn to a5, you realize your bishop is trapped, you realize you're losing material, you're very frustrated yourself, and, you know, you could very well lose the game pretty quickly after this. So uh, this is where we'll talk a little bit more about how to kind of combine steps one and four. It's kind of like a checks and balances type of situation um, because you can kind of catch yourself and avoid blunders by, by, using, both of these, uh, by using both of these steps. So uh, we'll talk a little, little bit more about how to combine things later. But first things first here again, our opponent played a4. What's their idea? They want to play a5. How can we either stop that idea from happening or, uh, you know, kind of defend against it. Now, we would generally want to look first to see if we have any forcing moves of our own or any way to kind of one-up our opponent or make a stronger threat. It really just ends up in this particular position that there's not any great kind of counter-attacking moves. Uh, we don't really have any particularly great forcing moves in this position uh, to begin with. So we are going to have to make a defensive reaction here. And it ends up that there's two different moves that work in this position. You can either play the move pawn to a5, that prevents the opponent from pushing their pawn up to a5 themselves, or you can play the move pawn to a6, which is a little bit better, I will say, um, compared to pawn to a5. The slight drawback of pawn to a5 is that white can play the move pawn to b5, and your knight gets kicked backwards to either the eighth rank or the, or, or the edge of the board. Not usually a great situation to find yourself in. If you go pawn to a6, it is still possible for white to continue with pawn to a5 if they want to, but you can tuck the bishop back on a7, and the bishop is essentially doing the same thing on the a7 square that it was doing on the b6 square. You have a nice diagonal aiming towards the opponent's king, and black is doing totally fine in this position here. So again, why did our opponent play their most recent move? 
what's their threat, what's their idea. Don't skip over this step. It will cost you many games. And if you do think about this question in your in your games, it will save you many games. It will prevent you. Uh, it will help you to reduce the amount of mistakes or blunders you might make, and that will hopefully help you to have better results. So let's go ahead into our second uh, position. And the second position here is going to focus on step number two. So in this game, Black just played the move bishop to e7. Now we could still start with step one. We could still say to ourselves, okay, why did our opponent play bishop to e7? Why did they do this, et cetera, et cetera. Suffice it to say that after the move bishop to e7, the move bishop e7 itself is not really making any threats, though there is this idea lingering in the position of Black maybe being able to take the pawn on e4. Now, Black did not make this move uh, in the first place. Um, I'm not entirely sure why, quite honestly. I do think if they take on e4, maybe a potential drawback is that white can trade the queens. And then it's very likely with the bad pawn structure that white will win back one of these pawns at some point. But that's not going to be the focus of what we're, uh, <laughs> what we're focusing on here. So that being said, Black just played the move bishop e7. The move bishop e7 itself is not really making any threats. It's not doing anything that we need to react to. But there is still this idea of the pawn capturing us on e4 that we need to be aware of. So then we move on to step two. What forcing moves do we have available? What checks do we have? What captures do we have? What threats do we have? It's very important to kind of see the big picture or see all of these options in the position. Whether they're bad moves or good moves is a little bit of a different matter, but you do want to see kind of all the possibilities. So first things first, there are no ways to check the opponent's king. There's just no lineups or ways to hit the opponent's king in this position, so there's no checks. In terms of captures, there are two different captures that are available. We can take the pawn on d5 with either our pawn or with our queen. Taking with the queen is pretty silly. It is protected by the pawn, so we would end up losing our queen there. But taking the pawn on d5 is a forcing move uh, option that we might want to consider. Um, the third category of things is what threats do I have that are available? Threats being like a lower value piece attacking a higher value piece or attacking something that is undefended. Or adding maybe a surplus of attackers on something that is defended. There's not really any great threats that we can make in this position. Um, none that don't cost us some kind of material in the first place. So really, the main forcing move we might have in mind in this position is to take the ball on d5. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean we have to play this move, but it would be the first move I would think about in the position. If I take this pawn on d5, first of all, how is the opponent going to respond? So this kind of jumping right along to the fourth step in the thinking process, uh, doing the blunder check. If I take this pawn, how's black going to respond? Do I have any good follow-ups to what my opponent could do in answer to my move? And it does end up in this position that taking the pawn on d5 is a good move. Uh, first things first, if black recaptures with the queen, here we can just go ahead and castle the king. We don't even need to trade the queens. Pretty much here, black is left over with a pretty bad pawn structure. The A and C pawns are all isolated and doubled, and this is just a slightly more pleasant position for white because of that. The main move we would want to uh, anticipate, you could say, is what if black takes back with the pawn? Seems a little more cohesive of a move to uh, anticipate here. And then the question would be, do we have any follow-ups? Do I have another forcing move that I can play from here, or what would I do next in response? And it, it does end up here that now we have a new forcing move available, and that's the move bishop to b5 check. This check is now available because the pawn is no longer on the c6 square. It is a check, so it's very high, pretty much the top of the hierarchy of forcing move options. And the question would be again, how might my opponent respond to this particular move? And do I have a good answer for their response? Or what would I do as a follow-up? Uh, first of all, if black blocks with the pawn, that pawn is undefended. We can simply take the pawn on c6. Very bad news for black. They're going to lose the rook due to the fork. If black blocks with the bishop, we could also ask ourselves a form of a question like, what did my opponent's most recent move change about the position? What did the move bishop to d7 change about the position here? It actually ends up that now that the bishop is on d7, the queen is no longer protecting this pawn that's on d5. And so... It is available. It is a forcing move option for us to consider. The capture of queen takes d5 in this position would allow us to pick up a pawn for free and protect our bishop simultaneously. And this actually ends up just being a very, very, very good position for white. We're up a pawn. We are continuing to put pressure on black. Life is good. The game goes on, but we do have extra material, which is very nice. 
the final option for black, uh, I guess they could block with the queen, but of course we would be very happy to take the queen with the bishop. Probably black's best option is to play king f8. When I say best, it pretty much just means the option that doesn't <laughs> doesn't lose material. Um, but black is obviously not very happy about having to move their king early in the game. They can no longer castle. Uh, we could now castle our king ourselves if we wanted to. But you could also continue looking for more and more forcing moves. Maybe you recognize the possibility of attacking the rook in, on a8 that's undefended. And maybe here you find the move bishop to c6. And all of a sudden, white is in big, uh, sorry, black is in trouble. The rook is hit, the pawn's hit. Once the rook moves away, we can pick up the pawn on d5. Life is good for white. We've won material, and white's in good shape here for sure. So again, this is the importance of uh, looking for forcing moves yourself um, rather than just automatically thinking about kind of, let's say, like autopilot moves. Again, from the start, you might think, oh, the pawn on e4 is being attacked. I need to defend it, or I need to react to this. Maybe I need to push the pawn. Uh, sorry, after bishop e7. Maybe I need to push the pawn, or maybe I need to uh, defend the pawn, or maybe I need to you know, do something that is more of a defensive reaction rather than a proactive counterattacking move. So again, always be on the lookout for your own forcing moves. Um, even if your opponent is making a threat, see if you can one-up them or answer their attack with your own attack and uh, yourself. Okay, so we're going to move on to the next position. The next one is going to focus on kind of a combination of steps one and two. Okay, so this is the next position here. Here it's white's move. And in the game, white made the move rook to d1. And the question would be here, what is the idea behind our opponent's move? What are they trying to do? Um, that would be the first question to ask ourselves. So after white plays the move rook to d1, they are lining up the rook and the queen to attack the pawn on the d6 square. So that's their idea. It is a threat. If we do absolutely nothing about it, they will take the pawn, and that's probably not what we want to let them uh, do. We don't want to let them take a pawn for free. So then the next step would be, do we need to make a defensive reaction or can we make an offensive reaction? Again, you want to try to look for your own forcing moves and offensive reactions or counterattacks first instead, um, and only look for defensive moves if none of your offensive moves work in the position. So in terms of forcing moves we might consider, a move that might come to mind here is pawn to d5. We advance the pawn forward. We move it to a square where it's a bit better supported. Uh, it is protected now by the pawn on c6. If any of the pieces capture the pawn on d5, they will be losing material because it's an unfavorable trade. And so we answer our opponent's threat with a counterattacking move of our own, and now they need to make some kind of response to our idea. Probably given the circumstance, white would make a move like bishop to b3. But now what we can do is continue looking for forcing moves. Do I have any checks, captures, or major threats that I can make? The only check that's available is a queen sacrifice, which is not that great. The only capture that's available is to take the pawn on a2, which is protected, which is not that great. Can I make a major threat? Can I attack something of high value or use a lower value piece to attack a higher value piece? And it ends up here that we have the move bishop to a6. And this is a move that just wins material on the spot. Black is lining up through the queen on d3 towards the rook on f1. We're making a skewer. Wherever the queen moves away to, we will take the rook on f1, maybe something like queen to d2. We pick up the rook, white recaptures, and we are simply up a rook versus a bishop in this position. We've won material. Life is good. This is a good outcome for sure. So again, it's very important that you're not starting off with a defensive reaction here. It's very easy to play something like rook to d8 oh, I'm protecting my pawn on d6. You've, you've, you've gone for step number one, which is good. It's better than losing the pawn on d6 uh, you know, completely. But you miss an opportunity to look for a stronger response, a more forcing response that can put the opponent on the back foot, on the defensive. And again, d5 followed by... Uh, sorry, d5 followed by bishop to a6, picks up material, and life is going very well for black here. Okay, so let's assume that, again... Our opponent's most recent move did nothing that we need to react to. And then we have no good forcing moves of our own. That takes us along to step number three. So let's look at the next position. So in this position here, white has just made the move queen to b5. This was the move that they just played. We can still practice this uh, flow chart of questions. Why did they play the move queen to b5? What's their idea? What are they trying to do? Do they have any threats? Is, are they doing something that I need to react to? And it kind of ends up that 
they're not really threatening anything. Uh, they move the queen to a square that's useful and active somewhat, but everything in our position is pretty well protected. Anything that's not protected is not being attacked. And so there's not really anything that we're overly bothered by in this position. Our e4 pawns defended, our d5 pawns defended, uh, our bishop is undefended, but white's not attacking it. Our rook's undefended, but again, white's not attacking it. There's not really anything that we need to react to in this position at this point. So then we go to step number two, and we ask ourselves, you know, what forcing moves do I have that are available myself? There's not really any good checks or captures or major threats in this position. Maybe there's a move like pawn to a6, which does attack the queen. However, if we play pawn to a6 right away, I think white's just going to take the pawn on b6 because that's no longer protected. And so it's probably not a good move for us to play a6 here. So again, step one and two, we've gone through. No response required from our opponent's move. No great forcing move for ourselves. So now it's up to us to find just some kind of improvement in the position. Now again, those three questions were, what's my opponent's plan? Uh, which of my pieces are badly placed? And what are the weaknesses in the position and can I exploit them? So here, I wouldn't really say I'm 100% sure what White's plan is with Queen to b5. Again, I don't really think that they're doing anything with this move individually that we need to be bothered by. Um, maybe their plan is to come into d7. I'm not really sure, quite honestly. But we'll, you know, that move is not on the board just yet. If that move does occur, we'll cross that bridge when it happens. But right now, that's not really a big deal to us right now, uh, immediately. So then... Do we have any pieces that are badly placed? I would say here that both the rooks aren't really in the game, and the knight especially is on the back rank, which is very poorly placed. Probably of these three pieces, the knight's the one I would really like to improve the most. And then the third question is, uh, what weaknesses does my opponent have, and can I try to exploit them? I would definitely say here that white's king is a bit weak. They do have a little bit of uh, Swiss cheese holes around the king side, a little bit of light square weakness in this position. And if I could somehow get this knight to the f3 square or the h3 square, maybe that would deliver a check towards the opponent's king and create some very dangerous attacking chances around the king side. That would be really nice. I would really like that. So we have a badly placed piece. We have a couple of weak squares. And we try to kind of put the pieces of the puzzle together. And so it ends up in this position that a way of kind of combining uh, both of these things are a bit of a multi-purpose move that's a good one in this position, is to play the move knight to e6. It seems kind of simple on first glance. Okay, the knight was on the starting, uh, well, not the starting square, it was on the back rank. I just want to get it off of the back rank. Th these questions are not necessarily meant to be anything groundbreaking or anything super crazy or overly complicated. Sometimes it's just about asking the right questions in order to come up with the right answers to help you to play the position in the best way. So we move the knight off of the uh, eighth rank, we get it to e6, and the goal is to go to g5, and then into f3, or then into h3, and we can definitely stir up a pretty big attack around the opponent's king side once the knight starts getting activated. And you can see that now it's already white who needs to be careful. If white ignores what we're doing, maybe they just try to get their bishop in the game. We can already do stuff like knight to g5. If they take the pawn, there's different discovered attacks that are available towards their queen. And stuff like knight f3 check is already a big deal. If bishop to b2, maybe knight f3 check, they take, we take. I can already imagine the queen sliding in, continuing the attack. It's a bit of a dangerous position for white for sure at this point. Okay, so again, we ask ourselves these questions, especially in positions where our opponent didn't do anything we need to react to right away, or uh, when we don't have any great forcing moves of our own. We try to make just some small improvements or gradual improvements in the position. Okay, let's go ahead to step number four, and we'll look at positions for that one. Okay, so let's say we have this position here on the board. This occurred in a game. In this particular game, black took the pawn on d4, white recaptured, and now it's on black to figure out what they're going to play here. So a question I want you to ask yourself here is maybe, maybe you want to play a move like bishop c5. Um, you recognize that the knight capturing back on d4 didn't do anything we need to react to. You're looking for forcing moves, and you see maybe bishop c5 looks like a good one. You develop a piece, you attack a knight. How bad could it be? So this is where the fourth question is very important. If I play the move bishop c5, I need to do a blunder check, or at least before I make the move. If I play this move, what forcing move options 
checks, captures, and threats does my opponent have in the position, what, what's available for them. So it ends up here that bishop to c5 is actually a big blunder. If you play the move bishop to c5, uh, it looks good. You're attacking the knight. You feel like you're doing something aggressive. You're attacking them. But you neglect to think about how white might answer with their own forcing moves. And it ends up here that white can now make the move bishop takes f7 with check. Because check is the highest up on the hierarchy of forcing moves, we have to respond to the check. We have to either take the bishop or move away. If we move away, I mean, white did just get to capture a pawn for free, so it seems kind of, you know, seems pretty bad if that's uh, our best case scenario. So the main move we would want to consider is taking the bishop. Now, if, if, if this wins material, that's great. Unfortunately for us, it does not win material. White can follow this up with the move queen to h5 check, attacking the bishop that we just developed as well as checking the king at the same time. And no matter how we react to the check, maybe we block with the pawn, White's going to take the bishop on c5. They are protecting their knight. All of a sudden, we're down a pawn. Our king is exposed. This is really not a position that we would like to have. This is this is very bad for us. So notice here, you know, in the game, black did play bishop c5. Uh, I will say at the same time, white did not punish it. In the game, white played, uh, I think they played pawn to c3, if I remember correctly. Um, but kind of both players made mistakes with various parts of this thinking process. Uh, Black made the mistake of not doing a blunder check and anticipating what forcing move options White had available. White does have a check that would need to have some, some consideration. And it ends up that pretty much two checks in a row and then taking the bishop leads Black into a very bad position. So let's take a look at another position that falls into this category of uh, considering a blunder check. And that's going to be this position here. So here it's White's move. Uh, Black did just play the move knight to e7. You could ask yourself, what's their idea? What are they trying to do? Is it a move that requires a response? Um, I think Black's idea is to maneuver the knight to a better square, maybe to the f5 square. Uh, but at least this on this exact move, knight to e7 did not make a threat or do anything that we need to respond to. We essentially have a free move in this position. Now, we also don't really have any great forcing moves in this position. There's no checks. There's no good captures. There's no good threats. So we go to step number three, and we just try to find a way to improve the position. Probably the best way to improve the position here is to develop a new piece, right? We still have the knight and the bishop on the starting square. The queen hasn't moved. The rook on the corners hasn't moved. We probably just want to continue getting our pieces into the game and get them to good, useful squares. So let's say here that a move we're considering, uh, maybe we're looking at knight c3, and we're also looking at bishop g5. Each of these moves develop a piece, they both have a lot of logic behind them. The knight develops towards the center. The bishop develops and makes a pin. What I want you to do is pause the video and see if you can work out which of these is better based on doing a blunder check. If you play knight c3, how might the opponent respond and do they have a good forcing move option that would be bad for us? If we play bishop g5, how, does the, how might the opponent respond and do they have a good forcing move option that might be bad for us? So it ends up in this position, the bishop to g5, is a mistake and knight c3 is the better move. The reason that bishop g5 is a mistake is because now that the bishop has developed, the pawn on b2 is no longer protected. And this is always a kind of a part of the uh, part of the blunder check series of questions you could ask yourself. What did my most recent move change about the position? You could ask the same question in the first step about your opponent's move. What did their move change about the position? But you also want to consider what your move changed about your position as well. Once this bishop develops, the pawn is no longer protected. Black has this move queen to b6, which is very strong. And there's really not a great way for us to protect both the b2 pawn and the d4 pawn simultaneously. And we're just going to lose one of the two. For example, if we play the bishop back to e3, black takes the pawn on b2. Now the rook in the corner is hit. We probably have to play the move knight to d2 to keep the rook protected. And then worst case scenario, black retreats the queen back to safety. And they are up a pawn. I think that black is a little bit better off at this point. Another move that black might consider is continuing along with their knight f5 idea. Here, black is definitely better. They're up a pawn. The pressure on the d4 pawn is annoying. Uh, even if you play a move like rook to b1, you might still lose the pawn on a2. And suffice it to say that black is going to have a better position here. He's ahead two pawns for the moment. Even if you get one of them back, you're still down a pawn. 
Black is going to catch up in development and eventually castle, and Black is going to be better in this position. So it's very important here, again, with whatever move you're considering, you do this blunder check. Um, now, in comparison, Knight to c3 is a better move. It doesn't weaken anything in the position. If Black does still play the move Queen to b6 or Knight to f5, they do attack the d4 pawn, but the b2 pawn is protected. So Knight to f5, we can play a move like maybe bishop to e3 to guard the pawn, or we can play knight to e2 to guard the pawn. And even if black continues piling up the pressure, um, I guess here maybe we do go bishop e3. It's a little bit of a different form of things, I will say, if black decides to grab the pawn on b2 this time. Um, essentially, the bishop is a little more productive guarding the pawn. Maybe you can still play rook b1 and take the pawn on b7. Um, so that all being said, knight c3, uh, does keep things a little more uh, homogenous, you could say. Maybe instead of guarding this pawn um, and playing knight to e2, you can also do something like knight to a4, which is another example of a more forcing move, kind of one-upping the opponent. You're counterattacking the queen rather than making a defensive move, and now black has to move the queen. You guard the pawn, uh, they have to retreat the queen, and you didn't have to uh, lose any material or anything like that. So again, bishop g5 runs into trouble because it leaves the pawn on b2 undefended immediately, whereas knight to c3 is a better move. It doesn't weaken anything, doesn't give the opponent any big chances, and is a better move in comparison. So let's move along to our final position, which is going to focus on combining steps one and four at the same time. Okay, so we're going to look at, I, well, I, I said final position. It's technically a game that we're going to look at, but it's two main positions. One position for white we'll focus on, and one position for black a little bit later. So this game begins with the moves e4, b6, knight f3, bishop b7, black is attacking the pawn in the center, white plays knight c3 to protect it, e6, d4, and black here makes the move bishop to b4. Now again, we always want to ask ourselves, why did our opponent play their most recent move? Uh, what's their idea behind this move? What are they trying to do? And then with whatever move we ultimately decide uh, or kind of choosing between, we need to ask ourselves, if I play this move, what forcing moves do they have in response? So this is, again, where kind of this combination of steps one and four, this is kind of a checks and balances situation. If you don't necessarily recognize your opponent's threat or their best move with step number one, you hopefully will recognize it once you get around to step number four. So in this position, I'm going to try to walk you through how white might have approached the position. They saw that the knight was pinned. They saw that if the bishop takes the knight, the pawns would get doubled. And because of that, they played the move bishop to d2 in the game. Now, bishop to d2 does address the capture of the knight. It does break the pin. But you still have to ask yourself the blunder check side of things. If I play bishop to d2, what forcing moves does black have available? How might they play with a forcing move? It ends up here that black can simply play knight, bishop takes knight on c3. White recaptures. And now the pawn on e4 is no longer protected. And now white is just down a pawn all of a sudden. So this was already a bad way for white to start the game, and they're down material without any real counterplay going on. What would have been a better move in comparison is recognizing that the threat of taking the pawn on e4 is the bigger of the problems that white needs to solve. And the best move for white is probably just to play the move bishop to d3, where you protect the pawn that's on e4. This pawn is safe. Even if black takes the knight on c3 and doubles the pawns, that's not the biggest deal in the world. Holding on to your uh, e4 pawn is more important. At least here in comparison, you get the pair of bishops despite your pawn structure being a little worse. So it's not really a trade that's all that bad for white. I would actually be pretty happy to be in white shoes here despite the pawns being a little bit fractured. Okay, so the game though did continue with bishop to d2. White lost the pawn and we'll fast forward a couple of moves. So bishop d3 was played, knight e5. And then in this position, we're actually gonna flip it now to black's point of view. And white played the move queen h5. So we ask ourselves, why did our opponent play their most recent move? What's their idea? Do they have any forcing moves or threats that they're making against us? So here white is threatening to play queen takes f7 checkmate. That's a very big threat. Very high up on that hierarchy of threats. It is pretty much something we need to defend against. We're not going to find any kind of counterattacking move that beats out a checkmate threat. Um, only if you could make a check would you be able to kind of uh, ignore the opponent's threat. And simply put, we have no way to check white's king. So we need to defend against this threat in some way. 
Now there's a couple of different options that are available. You can play pawn to g6. You can play knight to g6. You can castle the king. And you can play rook to f8. All three of the, or sorry, all four of these options defend against the threat in some in some way. Now, only one of these four is good to go for. Uh, one, a second one is playable. Let's put it that way. But only one of these four is is best. Now, it ends up in the game that Black played one of the bad options. Black played the move knight to g6, which is a big blunder. And the problem is he didn't think through what white could play in response. He didn't think what forcing moves might white go for um, if we play knight to g6. If we ask ourselves what options does white have available, there's not really any checks that white can give, but there are a number of captures revolving around this little sector of the board. And white did end up playing bishop takes g6. We have to take back with the f pawn. We can't take with the h pawn since we would lose the rook on h8. The h pawn is pinned. f takes g6, knight takes g6. And again, the pawn is pinned, our rook is hit, there's a bunch of discovered checks that are coming up here, and black is already in very, very big trouble at this point. Black is simply just down a pawn and going to lose more material. In the game, black played queen f6, white took the rook, and white won the game later on. So knight to g6 does not work as a defensive option. Uh, castling looks like it defends one threat. It does stop queen takes f7, but it actually falls for another threat. And here white would be able to play the move queen takes h7 checkmate because the bishop on d3 protects the queen. This would be walking from one checkmate into another, which is uh, not really solving the problem. Um, rook to f8 is the move that kind of works, but is still not that great. It does defend the mate. It doesn't walk into a different checkmate, but you do still end up losing a pawn on h7, probably g7, and this isn't really all that great. The best move is to play the move uh, pawn to g6. It's not the prettiest looking move in the world by any means. It's not a move we're necessarily thrilled about playing, but kind of by the process of elimination, it really is just the move we have to play. It hits the queen, it blocks off the diagonal. Uh, white has to react by moving the queen. If white tries to continue capturing on g6, it doesn't really work the same way because here we would just be up two pieces. So taking on g6 doesn't really work. White would probably play a move like queen to h6. And then we can try to continue pushing white backwards. Maybe we play a move like pawn to d6, for example. Maybe they move the knight. Then we play knight to d7. And again, it's maybe still not the most uh, great looking position in the world for black. Feels a little clogged up here. We still have to be a bit careful about white moving the queen further into our position. But suffice it to say, we're not getting checkmated. We're not losing a bunch of material. It's a little bit uncomfortable, but it's not the end of the world here in this position. We've also got some threats of our own. We're attacking the pawn on g2, for instance, and white needs to be careful about that. So through these positions, we've highlighted and focused on these four different steps in various ways. I would say, uh, as I mentioned earlier, steps one and four tend to be the ones that are most overlooked by players or, or kind of most underappreciated by uh, beginner and, and uh, intermediate players. Most of the times when I'm working with students in that rating range, these are where the mistakes are made. Um, now, the higher up you get on the rating ladder, generally speaking, players are making a bit less blunders, a bit less kind of large mistakes uh, by missing the opponent's threats or making unsafe moves themselves. And then usually the higher up on the rating ladder, the more you're focusing on like strategic play and small improvements. Step number three, a bit more. Um, but for a lot of players... Uh, steps one and four are the biggest pain points, you could say, and the ones where uh, they're kind of the lowest hanging fruit. If you can improve at these, four, uh, at these two, well, really all four of these steps, but especially steps one and four, they will help you to make less blunders, make less mistakes, play safer moves, play better moves, and that will help you to play uh, better chess ultimately. Now the final question, how do we work on this and how do we train this on our own? You know, you can watch the video here, you can learn about the steps, you can kind of, you know, hear my explanation, but you need to still practice it more than just watching this one video. So there's essentially two different methods for practicing this. There is the, uh, let's call it the paid method. <laughs> uh, and there is also the free method. Um, because we're on YouTube, I'm going to assume a lot of people will want to hear the free method. Um, so, uh, I'll give that one first. So the free method would be to 
when you're solving tactic puzzles, whether it's on chess.com or Lee Chess or any kind of tactic position you can come across, which I do recommend that really all players should be doing on a consistent kind of daily basis, trying to solve, you know, at least 15 to 30 minutes of puzzles and tactics per day is my recommendation. When you are solving puzzles, uh, this is essentially a perfect arena, you could call it, for thinking through these four steps. Uh, because you're outside of a game, you're not really affected by any kind of time situation. I do understand with some uh, with some puzzles on, on with online trainers that, you know, if you take too long to solve them, you'll get less points. But I don't think that should be the biggest deal in the world. Generally speaking, though, if you compare it to a game that you're playing, you're not really on uh, any pressure on the clock. You have all the free time in the world to work your way through the puzzle, to think through it, and have a good thinking process. So you have a puzzle position that you are being presented with. Most online trainers and puzzles will show you the opponent's most recent move. And so it'll show you the opponent's most recent move. You'll know that you have a puzzle or a tactic available in the position. But before you automatically jump into step two and start right away looking for your own forcing moves, start with step one. It'll show you the opponent's most recent move. Just ask yourself, why did they play that move? What does it change about the position? What's the idea behind it? Even though you already know that there's a tactic in the position, you can still get in the habit of asking these questions, and that will help you to kind of work on this thinking process. So that's that's how you can incorporate step one. So you think about the opponent's move, what the what it did. You do, you know, then you move to step two. You look for your own forcing moves. You can, for the purposes of a puzzle, you can probably skip step number three, quite honestly, because there is going to be a good forcing move or a good sequence uh, to play in the position. Um, but you, you know, you go through step one, you go through step two with the forcing moves. Uh, then you'd go ahead to step number four, whatever forcing move you were thinking about, or may, hopefully maybe like a couple of options you were considering between, depending on the difficulty level of the puzzle. Then in step four, once again, you ask, you, you do the calculation, you ask yourself, if I play this move, how might the opponent respond? What will they do in response to whatever move you're thinking about? I know with online puzzles, it's very easy to see a move that looks good and just play it without really anticipating or thinking about what the opponent will play. You play the move, you, and then you kind of think, oh, we'll just figure it out after they give me a response. While that might work in a puzzle, in a real game, that's you're, you're playing with fire. You're, you're going to kind of just be lucky in a lot of situations if you just rely on that type of thinking and don't really do your due diligence of really thinking through the position and anticipating what the other guy's gonna play. You're playing again like a PVE versus instead of PVP. So uh, you think through your move, you think through what the opponent will do in response, you think about your follow-up. And again, you're able to practice steps one, two, and four very well in tactic type puzzles. Now, another way that you can practice this is uh, adjusting the way that you use puzzles. And I'll probably go a bit more in depth on this in a future video, but you can also solve puzzles from the other side of the board. Uh, you can look at the puzzle from your opponent's perspective and think to yourself, uh, you know, whatever move the puzzle starts off with, you know that it's probably not a great move because it leads to a tactic. You could ask yourself, flip the board and say, if I play this move, whatever move the puzzle starts with, how might the opponent respond or answer my move? And there is going to be an answer because that is the way that the puzzle works. So you're kind of trying to solve the puzzle for your opponent rather than solving it for yourself. And this helps you to kind of change the perspective and get more uh, practice with thinking about your opponent rather than only focusing on what you want to do. So that's some ways that you can kind of practice this type of thinking process when you're solving puzzles. Now, you also, of course, want to try using it in games as well. I would probably say that in a game, the longer time control the game is, the better, because the longer the game is, the more time you'll have to think through all of these questions. But again, at the same time, the more you practice this type of thinking process, the more you ask yourself these questions in various positions you come across, the quicker you'll get with it. It becomes second nature more as time progresses. It's kind of like when you first learn to drive a car. Uh, there's I've used this analogy with students before as well. When you're first learning to drive a car, you know you have to think about looking in the rear view mirror, shifting into drive or park or, or reverse. You have to look uh, at your side mirrors. You have to turn your lane uh, blinker on. You know, you have, you, there's just a lot of things you have to do while you're driving a car uh, 
that you know once you've driven for for years and years you don't really think about it just it's second nature you don't think about all of those things when you're driving a car if you've been doing it for a number of years but when you're first starting to drive a car it's very complicated lots of things are going on and you have to think through all of this it's the same way when you're trying to implement or adjust your thinking process in chess if you like when you first start trying to do it it's going to take time it's going to you're going to have to be slow and methodical with it you don't want to rush the thinking process you want to try to think through your decisions as well as you can, because ultimately game, uh, chess is a game um, that's all about thinking. If you can outthink your opponent, you're more likely to win. Um, but the faster, uh, sorry, the more you do it, the more you practice you get, the more subconscious it becomes. And then as time progresses, it doesn't take so long because you're used to asking yourself all of these questions kind of subconsciously. So um, that's kind of the free method. <laughs> the paid method and this is a little bit of a, of a shill right here at the end of the, uh, of the video. But um, I do have a course on Chessable that is titled uh, Survive and Thrive, How to Blunder Less and Defend Better. This course is all about, uh, let's call it defensive calculation. Within this course, I have chapters uh, that begin with a warm-up chapter. Uh, then there's a what's the threat chapter. Every position in the what's the threat chapter presents you with your opponent's most recent move. You have to think through what they're doing with their move. And then how are you going to answer it? Uh, there are two chapters, uh, sorry, there is also a chapter uh, where you are going to start off the position in check. You're already being checked by your opponent. And maybe you have a couple of options for how to defend against the check. And you have to kind of do your blunder check off uh, process. If I play this move, is it safe? If I play this different move, is it safe? Can the opponent punish me? And so on and so forth. There's two other chapters that focus on kind of multiple choice options as well. You'll be presented with two or three different moves to, uh, to decide between. Only one of them will be safe and good to play. The other one or two moves will not be good for some certain reason, and you have to work through what the correct move is and why the other ones don't work. And then there is another chapter that is about blunder checks. I present you with, a move to cons uh, with one move to think about, and you have to figure out if it is a safe move or if it is not a safe move. Sometimes it will be a safe move. Other times there will be something wrong with it, and you'll need to find a better move instead. And then for those of you who are on the more advanced side of things, there is a chapter that I uh, titled Very Challenging. Um, and the chapter is very, very difficult. Uh, I know that Grandmaster Sam Shankland, who uh, did a little bit of the promo for the course for me, um, he, had, he had some trouble with some of the puzzles in this course, um, especially like the more and more difficult ones. So uh, for those of you who are advanced, I think it's a great, uh, a great course. For those of you who are a bit more on the beginner and intermediate side of things, it will have plenty of puzzles that you can work your way through as well, especially helping you to practice this type of thinking process. But again, this is uh, this does come with the cost. It, it, the link will be in the description of the video if you're interested in checking out that course. But again, there are also free ways to work on these things that I mentioned earlier. And so you can choose whichever path you want to go for. Okay, so all that being said, hopefully this video has helped you out. Hopefully it's given you a bit more of a framework for how to think through your thoughts and decisions when you're playing a game of chess yourself. Um, if uh, Now, as I said at the beginning, I did use the games of, I don't know if I said, I think I said this, I used the games of some kind of random 1,400 to 1,500 rated players on chess.com. If you're interested in having any of your games featured in the videos, um, feel free to leave a comment and let me know. You can give me your chess.com or Lee Chess username. And if you're up for having your games be shown in videos, then I'm happy to have uh, other people to, uh, to uh, kind of source games from. So you can let me know if you're interested in that in the comments for the video. Anyways, though, hopefully this has helped you out. Uh, I, I, just, I, I did just reach 1,000 subscribers, so I wanted to start kind of branching out a little bit more into uh, educational videos a bit more. Um, I've been doing a lot of speed runs recently, which has been nice, but I wanted to also branch out a little bit more as well. And uh, yeah, hopefully you guys enjoyed this. I'll see you around in the next video and I will see you later.